Okay, let's make sure everything works here. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, uh, this is the schedule that has been updated until uh, Easter. Okay, uh, that that should be the schedule. Okay, as uh, I wrote on the Telegram chat uh, channel, what's this called? Uh, we will move the lab on Monday, so we will have the lab in this room, and we will have the lecture on Tuesday in room 10i, okay? That is the room of the lab, so we will do three hours uh, all together, so no, no division in groups, but well, the groups will be here, okay? Uh, we should fit, I mean, today I counted you, we are more or less 60 people, no, not more. Okay, so we should fit in the room. Um, okay, so uh, uh, another um, let's say announcement. Uh, I already published the solution for lab number one. Of course, as any solution that we will publish, this is just a proposal. Uh, this is programming, so everybody can have a different idea on how to solve things and so on. So this is a possible way. We Typically, we'll try to do something that maybe you you didn't really think about, so you learned something new, okay? But it's not that what you did in the lab is necessarily wrong. And if you are in doubt, just ask during the labs, okay, to my colleague Antonio or myself if I'm there, or, or to the students helping us. I mean, typically the teacher is better, but, <laughs> you know, you can always ask. Um, <coughs> Okay, so this is just a proposal on how to solve things, okay? So, uh, you can have a look at them. Uh, I announced them also on the Telegram channel, so when I publish something important, I will announce it on, on, on the Telegram, okay? Everything is working, yes? So, today we will continue and finish talking about synchro asynchronous programming. Um, Okay, so basically we'll uh, finish this uh, set of slides. Uh, we will not create many things, uh, well programming I mean, uh, but uh, uh, we will uh, try some examples that we have on the slides. And uh, some examples are already available just now, okay, on the Git uh, for download. Um, so you remember last time uh, we talked about callbacks. Okay, and we started uh, started about talking about synchronous callbacks. That means that when I, they are called, they are executed, and the program is waiting for the completion, uh, for the termination of the callback. And today, instead, we will talk about asynchronous callbacks and asynchronous functions in general, which are, of course, a bit more difficult, so we will uh, spend more time on this stuff. Okay? First of all, you need to know that JavaScript uh, was born as, and it is, a single threaded uh, system. So it means that it can, it can execute just one single flow of execution at a time, okay? Even if you are on a multi-core CPU and whatever, everybody has multi-core even in the mobile phones, the programming system is single threaded, okay? So when it's executing code, it can execute just one flow of code at a time. Okay, so it's not like in, another, in other languages where you can typically create easily other uh, flows of execution. Typically, you call them threads, like in Java, for instance. It's very easy. You, you create a thread, you give some code, it ex gets executed in parallel. Okay, and so how can we deal with this problem in JavaScript? Well, actually, you already <laughs> got the idea uh, here. Uh, uh, the, the key point is writing callbacks and make them execute code asynchronously, okay? But how can they work asynchronously? We need to understand how the uh, JavaScript interpreter system works and the environment in general works because this is fundamental to understand when and how our code and the code that we, we use will be executed, okay? So, in short, 
we can uh, we need to understand uh, how the execution environment works and how this uh, very important concept in JavaScript the e event loop works okay uh, this is uh, for both for JavaScript environments such as Node.js the one that you used uh, until now and the, Java, uh, the JavaScript when it's in, in the browsers okay in the browser the behavior is uh, the same okay there will be a few callbacks and a few library function that changes and this uh, will be the topic for next lectures you know? not this week but uh, next week I think um, but I mean the, the model of execution is the same so let's have a look at this code uh, we define a function actually we don't even write what, what the function is supposed to do okay we just pass some parameter and we do some something like a, a console log if you want to do something that's very easy okay and and then you can say well execute this function but after a certain amount of time okay so this code the code of the function will be executed asynchronously so not now not when the set timeout is called but after a certain time who is going to execute this code well we need to find an answer and now we will find it uh, by the way set timeout is a predefined function in javascript that basically allows you to schedule the execution of something and in particular a callback because we need to pass an object that is a reference to a function and after a certain time okay this is milliseconds that's why it's 2000 not two okay and then some parameters but we'll see them later uh, well first of all remember that these asynchronous techniques are very useful in particular for the web environment why because in the browser everything happens asynchronously you click on something in the web interface you never know when the user is going to click the button or the object and so on so that's an asynchronous event by definition another asynchronous event is you go to a server and ask for something and the server takes some time to reply we don't really know how much time it will take it will take uh, a few milliseconds it will take uh, two seconds 10, 30 seconds we don't know but at a certain time a certain point uh, the um, the answer will come back and this again will be an asynchronous event typically every input output operation from our program are asynchronous events okay and you need to decide if you want to wait for 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 the answer or you will be interrupted or in a certain in a certain way you will handle the answer when it will come back okay and we of course we will use the second model because if we use the first model in a single threaded programming environment we block everything until we get an answer and we don't want this because if we block everything in the browser it means that everything is blocked you can you click you you interact with the page and nothing happens so uh, you, your application looks uh, like uh, if, if it's uh, you know freezed blocked completely okay and we don't want this behavior of course so if you use this blocking programming model so wait for an answer to each call that you do and you expect that it takes some time uh, you basically freeze everything okay of course you cannot really do everything asynchronously if you need to iterate on an array and find a maximum okay you you do it you iterate and you find the maximum that's simple code but if you expect the code uh, uh, finishes uh, uh, after a certain amount of time and in the meanwhile you can do something else you should write asynchronous code okay um, and this is a, a concept that, that applies not only to the browser but also to outside environment like uh, you are accessing files on the on the uh, local uh, file system it will take time to retrieve all the data and so on okay um, so basically as i said before all input output operation io operations uh, are typically handled best, better in this way okay um so uh, uh for us it's not that that 
big problem because JavaScript programs are typically event-driven. What, what does it mean? We are programming in the browser again, so we react to something that is happening because of the user, because the user clicked, uh, moved the, 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 the mouse, uh, the pointer, and interacted in some way with our application. So this is not really a big problem. I, instead, it's in some way uh, an advantage in some way. Okay? So, um, first of all, we are going to see the simple way of handling uh, asynchronous code that is with asynchronous callbacks. Okay? So, it's very easy for very simple thing. And then, in this lecture, uh, now and in the second hour and a half, we will see a more advanced way of handling this, uh, this uh, situation. Because we will see that this this simple way of handling things uh, has limits, a lot of limits, okay? So let's uh, have a look at this very simple example, okay? So uh, we'll read something from the keyboard, okay? So we are in Node.js environment, we read something from the keyboard, and we will print uh, something that is, uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, given to us, okay? I think, uh, uh, yes. So... Uh, how can we read from the keyboard? Well, uh, it's not really a common way of programming in Node.js, so actually we need to load some external library or package, actually this read line package. Uh, we need to say that we want uh, to wait, interface input and output, and then we can, let's say, with this pet to question, print something and wait for an answer. But wait for an answer, what does it mean to wait for an answer? It means that to our function, this question, okay, it, that is made available that by the read line, we need to pass what? A, a reference to a function, so a callback that will be executed once the, um, the input has been inserted, okay? So you finish inserting the input. And every library has, has its behavior. Like in C, when you press the enter here, the input will be captured and passed to the callback. Okay? And the callback is free to do whatever uh, it wants with this input, like uh, uh, print it and so on. Okay? So let's have a look uh, here. Yeah, I think the, 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 that's the best place. Uh, a most, um, a, a better, uh, well, uh, yeah, a better example that I put uh, uh, online just before the lecture started. Actually, it's here, okay? It's in the usual place where I put the stuff uh, do, uh, done during the lectures, okay? So from the home page, it's lecture examples. That's a repository, you know, this AW Wix. So in this week 03, you already find this read line slides. I mean, actually, it's a bit more elaborated than, than the one on the slide, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, just to, to give you a rough idea on how it works. So in the meanwhile, we, we also, uh, you know, review how to uh, handle packages and so on, I, I, even though in the lab you should have experienced uh, these kind of things, okay? Uh, actually, it's not. Uh, this is not really the directory I was uh, showing you before because there are other files. But anyway, um, uh, well, let's work in that the other directory. That's better. So um, just uh, open an additional folder here. Okay. So you also uh, see how, how you can work with the. Um, um, with the uh, Visual Studio Code. Uh, yeah, let's open that. No. Yes, this is opposed. Okay. Okay, so we have two weeks, week 03. Okay. This is the one that you have online, okay? Which is actually the same uh, as the other that is on my local PC, just, you know, to copy and paste and be quick when, when writing the code. So, first of all, let's try to make this work and see how it works. And then we will uh, play uh, a, a little bit, okay, with this example. 
So of course it, wo it will not work like this because this is a, a, a package and we first need to install the package, okay? If we just uh, run the code, it will not work, okay? No, it works. Wait. <laughs> That's a surprise. <laughs> uh, probably it's something that is being already installed or maybe it's default in, in some, well. Any anyway, let's, let's do uh, how, how we should do. Okay, so we npm uh, init and then npm install. Okay, no, npm install read line, sorry, read line. Okay, so actually you should have installed read line. Probably was already installed, maybe it's already available in, in Node for some reason from some versions of Node, that's why it works. Okay, but anyway. Okay, so what, what, do the, what does it do? Uh, it asks for, um, for something, okay? So there's this method question that prints the first parameter that, that is a string, just to say what we would like to get, and takes a callback, okay? Answer, okay? Let's give uh, an answer uh, test, okay? And then, is the task uh, important? Yes or no? Yes, of course. We are doing it actually. Task private? No. Task deadline? Well, I don't care. Uh, 2025. Okay. What did it do at the end? It just printed the stuff. Okay. So in the end, it's just a console log that prints uh, uh, what, what we got. Okay. Nothing really uh, strange or difficult. But what's the point here? The point is that we pass the callback at the first uh, call of question, and the callback is this one. You see where, where, where the bracket is closed? The bracket is closed here, right? So That's a callback of the first call to question. Okay, so I just uh, take the answer from the question and it puts into a variable this description that will be later printed by the console log. Okay, and then we want to do something else, right? Because we wanted to ask for an additional uh, input. Okay, how can we do this operation? Well, actually, you saw here what we did. Uh, we don't really know when the first input operation finishes. Actually, the only way when that we uh, that we have to understand when the op input operation is finished is that the callback that we passed is executed. So to understand when the input, the first input operation is finishes is finished, we need to be inside the callback of the first. Um, um, uh, the, the first callback. Oh, sorry, the, we need to be in, inside the code or the callback that we passed it to the first uh, execution of questions, so the first input request. Okay. And so, if we write code here, we are sure that the second call to question is executed just after the first one. Okay, the first one has got the input. Because the first one is executed immediately, but the callback is executed only when we get the input. Okay? And so we can insert a second call to question, and again, a callback, okay? That does something with the, with the answer, okay? Not really important what we are going to do. Uh, we assign it to another variable and so on, and we proceed in the same way, at a certain point, we finish our question and we print everything we got, okay? Uh, this is just a way to implement the stuff. I mean, we could have uh, used the different uh, names for the parameters. We don't need to assign anything, but uh, I mean, this is not really important, just programming, okay? Um, so you understand that uh, asynchronous callbacks are a bit more difficult to program, right? Because uh, we, we need to understand when they are called, 
and when they are called, we need to, you know, insert other code, typically inside these callbacks, because the only way we know these callbacks are called is by the fact that we are executing the code of the callback, okay? But anyway, this is a nice way to understand that, you know, that asynchronous programming is starts to be, let's say, uh, let's say a bit uh, more complicated than what we might have thought. Okay, so this was very simple uh, uh, example. We, we saw something a bit more complex, okay? Um, but in any case, uh, um, you know, uh, to, to do something, basically, uh, we need to be in the callback that we passed to the function that we will call the callback, okay? Okay. Let's have a look at the more simple example, okay? We started from a difficult one, but, but you know, uh, that's why when, when we are programming in JavaScript, we don't start uh, talking like in C, you know, uh, uh, scan for something and print something, because it's a bit difficult here, okay? It's not the easiest uh, starting point. Um, because we need to deal with this asynchronous behavior. Um, let's have a look at the timers before we go in the rest. Um, not just um, uh, a matter of being, uh, let's say, complete. It's just that timers uh, um, might be useful to your programming also for web applications. You want something that happens after a certain time, like you want to make something disappear from the interface, or you want something appear in the interface after a certain time that something else has happened, and so on. And you need to use these timers, okay? It's not difficult, but we need to understand how to use the functions and the fact that what we, pa what, what we pass to set timeout, so the, the, the function that creates the, this timer, is uh, again, uh, um, uh, an asynchronous callback, okay? So, Node.js and the JavaScript environment in the browser gives us two possibilities to delay the execution of uh, uh, code, that means callbacks. So that's this first set timeout and the second one set interval. Set timeout runs the callback uh, function after a given period of time, but that, uh, it does it just once. Okay, just one time. And the set intervals uh, runs the callback function periodically. So we want something happen, let's say, every second. We can just set, uh, uh, set the, attach the callback to this set interval, and the callback will be run every, let's say, one second. Okay? A typical example is you want to have the clock updating in the web interface every second, right? You have a callback that reads the time and update the time every second. Okay, how is this used? Well, um, first parameter, um, yeah. first parameter is uh, uh, a, call, uh, a callback. So we need to pass a reference to a function. Either the function is already defined somewhere, or we define it on the spot like a we are used in JavaScript, you know, with arrow functions, for instance. Here, the set timeout takes an arrow function, no parameters here, it just because it pr just prints a fixed uh, string, uh, hey, okay, after one second. Okay, console log a high. This is just to show you uh, when things uh, get executed, okay? Um, let's, let's try this example, okay? Just to give you an idea of what's happening. Okay, uh, let me play here a new file. Uh, set timeout, timeout JS. Okay, use strict. Never forget it, it's always better. I know this code is very simple, probably it doesn't give us problems, but you know, try never to forget this. So node set timeout, okay, what happens? Uh, look at the terminal, so look in, in the bottom part of the screen. Hi, and then we get hey, right? So first thing get, that gets printed is hi, why? Because the 
set timeout is just uh, um, uh, taken a callback and we say this callback is to be executed after a certain amount of time actually this uh, 1000 milliseconds so it means one second right so when you execute this uh, this call nothing happens uh, i mean on the screen there's nothing printed because there's a, a print instruction in in the callback but the callback will be executed later not now okay so this is an asynchronous callback because it's not executed now, it's executed later. It's different from passing a callback to you know, all the functional programming methods like the map, the uh, filter and so on. Because when we pass a callback there, we expect that the filter or, or the map starts executing, so starts it iterating over the array and it calls the callback immediately and waits for the answer every time until it finishes. So it's nothing delayed after, okay? And so here, uh, instead, uh, the execution of this uh, callback, so uh, this one, is delayed, okay, for one second. So it's scheduled for one second later. And the first thing that gets printed is hi. And then after one second, you get the, the other um, callback executed, and you get this hey. Okay, in the second one. So let's have a look again. Okay, so that's how the set timeout works. I mean, it should be pretty simple in, in terms of uh, uh, using it. Okay, so mm, not a big deal. Uh, and of course, you can have multiple set timeout and so on. You can have parameters passed uh, to the uh, callback. So the callback here is my function. I expect two parameters, first parameter, second parameter. For some reasons, you need to pass parameters. And you can do with the, uh, with the set timeout because the first parameter of the set timeout is the callback to be executed. The second is how much time it should wait in milliseconds. And the third, fourth, and so on parameters are just parameters that will be used when calling the callback my function. Okay, so basically you can specify whatever you want after the second parameter, okay? Timeout vi value is in milliseconds. Just be aware, we learned uh, the first edition of the course, we gave uh, a lab and we said, well, uh, just uh, after a certain amount of time, I have uh, uh, something changed in the interface, like be colored and so on. <laughs> so uh, some people uh, wrote some code that basically set a timeout uh, like after one month because it said, uh, you know, uh, when the deadline has passed, uh, just uh, make it uh, red or whatever. And we just played a little bit with dates, okay? <laughs> and, and this was not working at a certain time we discovered, uh, well, actually this timeout value in milliseconds is represented basically on a signed integer on 32 bits. So basically you cannot really put uh, one year here, okay? <laughs> but it doesn't make sense as well because, I mean, this is a web application. I mean, you're probably not keeping the, 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 the browser open for like 20 days with your application and same application and so on. Something happens in the meanwhile, okay? So it's a reasonable amount of time. Just uh, why, uh, uh, just to give you a reason why we, we, we put this, uh, uh, you, saw, you know, small note here, okay? Just because app, it happened to us that, uh, you know, the set amount was not working and because it, it basically uh, wrap around, uh, you know, when you put a, a number that is too big uh, to be represented on 32 bits, since there are milliseconds, you know. Okay, we can do the same with the set interval, scheduling the periodic execution of the callback. So where's the callback here again as the first parameter? This, uh, actually it's callback that does nothing, so this is, uh, code is useless, right? But if you put something here inside the brackets, like uh, a console log, you will see this function, this, this callback is called once every 2,000 milliseconds, so every two seconds, okay? And this is basically forever. So that's why we would like to get uh, something from the set interval in case we need to cancel the execution, so the call to the callback, the periodic call, okay? So this ID 
which actually we don't really care what it is. Could be a number, should be a number if I remember correctly, but it could be a reference to an object. We, we don't really care. There's a third function, clear interval. You give this handle and uh, it cancels the execution, the call to this callback, okay? Just to stop, uh, you know, the, the set interval from calling the callback. Okay, so we have seen a first, uh, let's say, way of uh, dealing with uh, uh, asynchronous callbacks. So we have seen uh, the input, but actually not really useful because, uh, I mean, just to play uh, with the Visual Studio Code or the terminal and so on. In, in web application, we will not get input in this way. And the, in, the um, uh, set timeout, the set interval to delay the execution of a function are much more use, useful, okay? Um, one more thing we would like to uh, underline now is how to handle error in callbacks. So you delay the execution of some code. If this, some, this code has to return an error, how can this code return the error to you? Because if it is executed synchronously, that's easy, right? Uh, you have a return value of the, of the function, and that's all, right? You execute a function as in the usual programming environment, C, Python, whatever. You execute a function, if there's a problem, there's a return value that will tell you error and something happened and so on, or everything is okay and so on. That's a return value usually. But if the function is executed asynchronously, uh, you're not getting the return value immediately, okay? Actually, when the function is executed and there has been a problem before the function um, uh, gets executed, so your callback is executed, how can the callback be notified that there has been a problem, okay? Because you, you write code in a, in a callback because you want to react to the execution of the function that, uh, uh, to which you post the, the callback. So like, uh, uh, let's have a look at this example. You know, read file. You want to read a file, and this file does not exist. Okay, that's a typical situation. But after you read the file, you want to uh, use the data that you got from this file. So where do you, do you use, uh, write the code that, uh, you know, handle this data? Well, uh, in the callback, right? Because we said, uh, how can we know that the function finished uh, the, what it's supposed to do? Well, the function will tell us how through the call of the asynchronous callback that we passed here in the beginning. When we say to the function, well, please start do something like read a file, okay? Before we say that after the input tell us the input is finished. Before we say that after two seconds, please call us uh, and we will do something, okay? If there has been a problem in the meanwhile, how can we be notified of the problem. Well, actually the only way at the moment we have to be notified is to have some additional parameter passed to the callback. Actually this is uh, actually not uh, really an official way, it's just a best practice, okay? Which is uh, anyway followed quite a lot by uh, uh, Node.js for instance, okay? So typically, the first parameter of the callback function is for storing any error, while the second and the rest is just the result of the operation, okay? If uh, the, the function is supposed to, to, uh, to return some errors, okay? Um, because like before, like the set timeout is nothing to return in terms of errors, okay? Actually, actually, I don't know the read line. We should check, uh, you know, what question is supposed to do. We should ch check the manual. In, in the manual, everybody will, will always say, you know, if there has been an error, 
if an error is uh, envisaged in, in, you know, in, in the execution of the function, it will tell you how to get this error, the information about this error. But you know, the typical way is this one, to have an additional parameter in the callback function. So there you can write something, uh, some code that reacts to this error, okay? If there's no, uh, oh, oh, okay, if there is an error, uh, you print it, you, you, I don't know, you, you set some value, you react in some ways, okay? Otherwise you process your data, okay? And in the first part of this morning, we'll play a little bit uh, with this uh, way of programming uh, using um, a database that is useful for uh, you know, doing the uh, lab tomorrow, I think, uh, yes. Just because, uh, you know, database basically are a, are a way to interact with the environment in an asynchronous way. So they are input-output operations, right? So I-O operations, and they are typically handled with asynchronous callbacks, okay? So we will start to, um, you know, um, be familiar with asynchronous callbacks in an environment that will be useful for us, uh, let's say, shortly, okay? Because then we will interact with the database to write our server application, okay? And after we have a, a, a working server, and this will take uh, more or less until uh, Easter, we will start focusing on, on the client part and building our application from scratch until you know, the end. But we need to have the server, otherwise in our web application, we don't have anything to, to show, okay? Okay, so uh, in this course, as in many others actually dealing with web applications, we don't uh, really want to store information just in files on the server, okay? We would like to have a, a database server. Uh, as usual, we try to use the simplest possible way of doing things because we have limited time, right? This, this course is eight credits. We don't want to make it, uh, you know, 12. Uh, and so basically, uh, we will focus on using a, a very simple library for handling um, a database, uh, but uh, this is in no way a restriction in terms of Node.js or whatever w you would like to use on the server, okay? In this course, of course, we will require you to use this uh, library uh, that is basically storing all the database in a single file just for convenience because then you need to submit uh, the, you know, the, the project, the final solution for passing the exam uh, and it's easier if we just, uh, you know, submit an additional file, since you already have to submit files, and so it's much easier for us and our DB, uh, our databases are not that complex. So, I mean, we, we can um, store them in a file quite easily, okay? But it's not uh, really a limitation for us, okay? So actually this library is a so-called in-process on-file relational database. So actually it's a relational database. It means that, uh, yeah, uh, it's a usual database that you learned, I hope, in the bachelor degree. I mean, uh, it's tables, right? With columns, rows, records, etc. You can extract and store information using SQL language. Okay, the, the, the usual language that you use with the relational databases, select, insert, update, delete, and all this stuff. So everything is supported. The only thing is that we don't really have a server, a database server, as you might have seen in, in database courses. We just have a, a library that is in process, means it gets linked, loaded uh, during the execution of the server program and uh, writes on a single file. So you, we don't have it to, you know, have complex directory structure and stuff, okay? Just a single file. We, we save the file, we save the database. We save the, the status of the database. So we, uh, let's say, uh, we, we played the, with the database, we uh, deleted, inserted stuff and so on. We would 
we would like to restore the original state of the database, just stop the server, copy the original file of the database, overwrite the current database, your database is restored. So very simple to use, and that's why we use it. Okay, so you don't have to, you know, recreate the tables and so on. Okay, all this stuff. Just copy the file and you start from scratch. Good. So how can we use it? Well, we use this SQLite NPN module. So it's a module like the others, like uh, we saw last time, DayJS, right? That's another one, SQLite. Um, actually, just be careful, there are uh, quite a few. Uh, as usual, we will sh uh, show you one, which is, let's say, the recommended one. Why? Because we give you advice on this. So uh, there are different uh, models that more or less do the same thing, but in a slightly different way. Okay? So mm, maybe in the beginning, it's better to stick with, uh, with what we recommend here, and then you are free to experiment if you would like, okay? So uh, we need to install this SQLite 3. SQLite is just the name of, let's say, the, the program and the format of the file for the database, okay? Uh, and it's quite widespread. It's not just uh, for, for us, it's not just a toy, but somebody uses it to, to store typically configuration information and stuff like that, okay? We install it and we use it. In the usual way, like the, the AJS, so require the name of the package, and then it's available. Well, first thing we need to know how to use this uh, uh, database is, uh, well, we need to specify a file where the database is stored, of course, right? because we can have many files with different databases. So that's done in this way, okay? We don't really need to care too much about uh, what that, uh, this means because it's always done in the same way. Just, you know, take uh, note of the fact that this is the name of the database. Can have any name. I mean, th we don't really care about the name. We, here it's called .sqli, can be .db, .whatever. I mean, we don't really care. Handling the format is a problem of the library, not our problem. And you see, uh, this function takes a callback, actually an asynchronous callback again, right? Which actually has really nothing to tell us in terms of data, resulting data, okay? Because there, there's already a, a return value of this uh, call, here the database call, which is a reference to an object on which we will have a number of uh, methods to call to run queries in the database, okay? But if we would like to have an uh, um, information about uh, how the open operation on the DB was performed, so uh, everything was okay or what, uh, there, uh, there was a problem, like uh, if you specify a, a, a file that does not exist, well, actually, I think it, it, uh, the, this, this function creates it, but uh, let's say specify a file that you cannot read for some reason for permission uh, issues and so on. So it cannot be opened. So we get notified how by the callback, and the callback has <coughs> an, uh, um, a parameter that informs us about the error. Okay? So uh, is typically null or undefined, so we can write something like this. If R, which means it's not a false value, we execute our code, and the simplest thing <laughs> to do in this case, as, we, as you see in the slide, just to throw this error and somebody else will take care of handling it. Uh, since we do it at the uh, top uh, level in our program, any exception which is, which is not handled at the top level basically uh, stops the execution of our program. We are in the Node.js environment here. It's not like in the browser. In the browser, something gets printed in the console, but it's not like uh, the page disappears, right? The page stays there, just the code is not executed anymore. In the Node.js environment, the, the, the execution is interrupted, okay? 
and something is printed, typically the content of the, the exception, okay? So that's, uh, let's say, a very simple way of handling this problem, actually stopping the program. Indeed, if we are not able to open the database, probably we cannot do anything else, so stopping the program is fine. And we get notified about uh, what's, what was the problem. We, can, we could have done, uh, let's say, console log something, but then we need to find a way to stop the program, right? Because, and, and we are in a callback. We cannot simply say return, because return here doesn't mean that the program stops. We are in the callback. That's the return value for, for database that has called the callback. And so the program will continue, okay? We cannot just simple say return and, and, and that's all. This is a callback. It's not a main flow as execution, okay? And that's why throwing the exception is a good way of stopping the program because we are at the top level and we know that we throw an exception, the program will stop, okay? Okay, let's have a look uh, very quickly on how to use it because then we will see example on this. But it's really not that difficult. There are uh, three, four methods that you need to know how to run SQL queries basically, right? So, uh, well, the typical query that you would like to run is the select, right? So, um, so just to read information in a database. Uh, how it is run? Well, you, you have this object, that, a reference to object that represents the database, and you have a few methods. One of them is all, to which you can pass um, a string, that is your SQL query. And then you have uh, a number of params, so you will see how, if they are useful and how, how they will be used. And then, and then we have an asynchronous callback to pass. Why? Because we don't know how, how much time it takes to perform the operation on the database, okay? It will take a while to read the file, search for the information. If, uh, the, the file is very small, uh, there's just one table, like say, okay, it will take not that much time. But it, if, if the file is big, there are a number of rows to be processed, uh, quite, a, quite a few of them and so on, it might take time. We don't want to block the execution of the program because we are waiting for the answer from the database, okay? So, we pass a callback that will be called when the answer is ready. And the answer is the answer of this query, okay? Select, etc. So it means there will be a table with uh, some rows, potentially zero, okay? But I mean, like in any uh, query using SQL, okay? And so we pass a callback uh, this uh, SQLite 3 module, actually package, let's say, uh, takes uh, callbacks with two parameters, like in the Node.js, uh, let's say, standard, <laughs> if we can, we can call it like this. The first parameter is R, if there has been an error, errors might happen. You write a wrong SQL query, there will be an error. You select on a table that doesn't exist, uh, it gives you an error, right? And, and so on. Uh, and then there, there are, uh, there's the data that comes from the query. Right? If everything goes fine, so you run the, the query and you get the table, you would like to read this table, right? So in rows, there will be um, a, here an array of objects. Okay, each item of the array is an object. It contains uh, the fields of the result, okay, in terms of the name of the column and the value, name of the column and the value. But this will be very clear when we have a look at an, at an example, okay? Mm, no problem. If R is true, so we can put it into an if, so it's a truthy value, actually, here it sets through the boolean value, some error occur occurred, okay? Uh, and uh, 
Well, actually, we cannot really do that much. I mean, we'll probably this will happen during uh, the development because you wrote uh, br the wrong uh, query and so on. But once it's fixed, uh, I mean, the the error should not be present. Okay. Um, why? Because this is just SQLite. So it's basically, as we say, the library inside your program. I, if the file is accessible, but we already checked for that, okay? Basically, you can run any, any query, any correct query, and at a certain point, you'll get an answer. You cannot uh, just have an error like uh, uh, the database server is not available and so on. I, it's a file, okay? So it will be readable. If it's readable, you can extract something, okay? How to run other queries? Well, um, you can run, uh, um, well, actually the same, the select in different ways. You can run it with get to get only the first row. So it's like the same as before. All gets all the rows. Get gets just the first one. Why? Because sometimes uh, it's very useful to get just the first row, like if you are checking if a user is present in the database, you typically don't expect to have, you know, 10 rows of the same user, okay? Um, uh, it's just more convenient for, for programming. And also there's this each, that means it's executed a callback once for each uh, result row. What's the difference? Well, the difference with all is that the all gives you an array of objects and it extracts all the information from the database since the beginning. While the each will extract the information one at a time. And so you don't uh, really fill up your memory if you need to extract a lot of information. And maybe you discover you, you don't need this information, okay? So you can extract uh, things uh, uh, row by row, okay? But let's say for, for our purposes, typically all is fine. Okay, we just need to remember that all returns an array and get returns uh, the object because it's just one. Okay, that's the only difference. Other queries, we would like to use also insert, update, and delete. Why? Because uh, uh, in your web application, you would like to store information coming from, from the client, from the browser. The user inputs some data, you need to store this data somewhere. Uh, or delete some data. The user says, uh, well, I don't need this data anymore. Delete uh, what's in the, in, in the lab, the, 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 f the films. Delete the uh, film, click, and, and this should disappear from the database and so on. So there are just basically other three keywords that we are going to use in, in SQL. So the insert, update, and delete statement. Actually, they are different from the select because the select returns tables. Right? Tables of data. This insert, update, and delete does not, uh, do not return uh, tables, just return a value that says uh, uh, how, the, uh, I mean, if everything was fine, so if the query was successful or not, okay? Um, how we know if the query was successful or not? We have uh, two values that we can check. Changes is the number of affected rows, okay? Like uh, update, you run an update, you say update, uh, I don't know, uh, update uh, scores, uh, so all the scores uh, for something, and you say score plus one, set it to score plus one, where, I don't know, uh, user is, uh, I don't know, is, has done the project of a web application, okay? So you have some information in the tables, you run the update, the update modifies the number of rows in the table, you can know how many rows were affected, so were modified through this change value, changes value. And uh, for the insert, there is also some um, some information that could be useful to you. Uh, we will use it uh, quite a lot. Uh, when you insert a new record into a table, often you ask the database to create a new unique ID for
for that record, okay? Um, if the database has done this operation, so has created a new ID, uh, this ID can be um, recovered through this last ID uh, variable that you can access, where in the callback function again, okay? So changes and last ID are accessible here in the callback function, okay? Uh, and depending on the query, they have different meanings, okay? Um, like last ID is typically useful for the insert. Yes, there's a question. The array params, yes, you are right. We didn't see it yet. We are, we are going to see it now. Thanks. Uh, so actually, we will write uh, queries in this way. So we will write uh, so-called parameters, uh, parametric uh, queries, okay? So we, these params are actually the values that we would like to use in the queries, uh, yeah, and they will be substituted uh, to the places, to the placeholders where we put the question mark. Okay. Uh, we will come back to this in a minute. Okay. Just to finish the discussion here, um, just be careful because the callback here, that's the only place where we, you cannot, you cannot use the arrow functions. The arrow functions will break this uh, uh, way of accessing these values, the changes and the last ID, okay? Because, I mean, for some reasons, the designers of the SQLI3 package decided to give us these values in this form. I mean, uh, make, make them available as fields of this that, of course, will be set before the call to the callback by the run, okay, of the SQLi3. They could have passed them uh, as parameters of the function. Yeah, uh, they could have done this. Uh, they didn't do that, okay? I cannot give you a reason. It's probably because when, when they started, they thought it was a good idea. And, and if you change things after a while that the library is used, you break things. You break compatibility with the past, right? So. Uh, we need to access them through this, uh, I, uh, to the, through the this object. And so for make the this work, we need to avoid the arrow function because you remember the lecture on the arrow, uh, on the this and the arrow functions as a different way of setting and accessing the this, right? It's from the enclosing scope. Here, if we pass a function with function, this is the standard way of accessing the this. So who is calling the fu this function can set the this to whatever uh, they want, basically, okay? Through the, the calls that we saw last time. Okay, so this is the only place where this arrow function syntax cannot be used, okay? This will happen in the lab for sure every time it happens. And you see, if you, if you Use the arrow function, we, you'll find that last ID and changes are not set. You'll find undefined and this kind of values. And no problem, you call somebody of, of us in, in some, some, you will call us in the lab and, and we will uh, help you, okay? And we'll probably say, wait, well, this is our arrow function, you shouldn't use the arrow function. So let's come back to the point of your colleague. So what was this uh, array here for? So, uh, well, um, that's a nice feature for this SQL3 library. Actually, it's a quite generic feature. It's so used in also many other database uh, management systems. Uh, so we can create pra parametric queries. So it means that we cannot really, we really don't need to construct the queries, you know, concatenating strings uh, ourselves, especially when there are parameters. I mean, select, select 
uh, asterisk from a table, and that's all. There's no parameter, I mean, not that difficult to run a query like this. But typically we have uh, uh, something like the where clause, because we would like to restrict where the queries operate, right? So on which rows uh, we would like to update, which row we would like to delete, uh, we, which rows we would like to select, and so on. So there's typically one, two, or more parameters that we need to add in our queries. And these parameters are basically values that need to be set and, and, uh, by, by uh, who is uh, running the query, right? And typically containing uh, some uh, you know, value that is dependent on the application. Like, uh, let's say I'm selecting uh, from the table course, so all uh, university courses, uh, a certain course, I need to specify the code, the, the ID, okay? I need to tell we, which is the value of the ID, like for this course is zero, one, something, I don't remember, okay? So we can, of course, create a string and say plus and, you know, concatenate something else and create the whole SQL string and run it, okay? But this is ma a much more convenient way of programming because it's more immediately readable and then also has another advantage that I'm going to tell you just now, okay? So first of all, how this works, where well, every time you need a, a parameter, you put a question mark in the string, in the SQL string, and then when you run the query with get, with all, with all the, the methods that we've seen before, in the second parameter you put an array with the actual values that you would like to substitute to the question marks, okay? And this will be done automatically by the method uh, of SQLi3, okay? Like here, we have a, a, a variable that contains uh, the code that we are interested in. So the string, zero, one dot uh, something, okay? Like the, the polytechnic codes for the, for the courses. We open an array. Uh, it always takes an array, okay? So even if there's just one element, we put an array. And we put the first parameter to be substituted to the first question mark. If you have uh, something else like and, uh, I don't know, name equal to another question mark, you can write a second parameter here. So comma, name, etc. okay? And will be substituted depending on the position. First with the first, second with the second, and so on. This is done automatically by the uh, methods that we are going to use. And please always use this method, so these parametric queries. Never use this approach that is possible and it works, but as a problem from the uh, point of view of the security of the web application, in particular the server, okay? Uh, that we are going to discuss uh, um, later, okay, in the course. I can, I can tell you just something to, to make you, I mean, say, a bit curious about this. Basically, if you concatenate uh, your string, you basically pass a single string uh, to the database to be executed. And if in the string that you pass, you include SQL instructions, they will, they will be executed. Like if the code is zero, one something, semicolon, drop table something, there are two instructions I mean, the, the SQL interpreter doesn't really care. Okay, you, s you, te you told me to execute two instructions, that's fine, I execute them, okay? And of course, if you specify the value yourself, no problem because you are, you're playing and you're not, you don't want to dis destroy your database, right? Or do uh, bad things with your database. But if the value will come from, from some client application where we don't really know what we are going to receive, this will be a problem, okay? And with this way of creating the parametric queries, what is specified in, in the place of the question mark will be never, never interpreted as SQL instructions, OK? 
okay? So in a certain sense, it saves uh, us a lot of troubles, okay? But we will tell this again uh, when it's time of, uh, of discussing this issue, okay? So now let's focus on the problem that we have here. We have databases. So let's say we have a, a database with a couple of tables, like a course. So there are a few courses. And uh, a, a table with, uh, with the scores. So uh, this is a student. Actually, there's no ID for the student, but it doesn't really matter. So somebody has uh, given the exam for this uh, code. And it's taken the, this mark 25, that's fine. And uh, we would like to play a little bit with the database, okay? So let's say we would like to extract, uh, you know, the, the scores for which um, the student has passed the exams, okay? So how, how can we do? Uh, we, of course, import the package. We open the database. Fine, we get this object DB. That's a name we, that we chose, but you know, try to use sensible, sensible names. I mean, not to call it uh, Pippo, or what's in English? Uh, I don't remember now. The equivalent, and, and you know, if you call it DB, you remember that that's a DB object on which you can run the, the, the queries, right? Uh, foo, okay? But not call things foo bar, etc. okay? And then uh, you have a query, SQL, here. Actually, here there are no parameters, right? So no need for the question mark, okay? And you can run it. Uh, this is a select, so you can run it with all. Okay, just be careful. You cannot just uh, run whatever you want with uh, any, any method. The run is for insert, update, delete, and the all is for the select, okay? But we, you will find it in, in the lab because sometimes uh, you take it wrong and it doesn't run and you call us and, and we will tell you, okay? So we run the query. Yeah, by the way, note that uh, the array that we were saying before is optional, okay? So we don't need to specify an empty array. It's just a detail, okay? Because the, the old function is, uh, let's say, smart enough to understand that the second parameter that we passed is not an array, but it's a function. So it means that the array is not present, that's fine, okay? And the second parameter here, it's a callback, right? We talked about asynchronous callbacks. So it's callback, it takes the first parameter, the error, second parameter, the result of running the query. So if the, there's an error, well, for the moment, just throw it. I mean, we cannot really do anything. Uh, if we are in the server, uh, but we will talk about the server later uh, this week. Huh? Yeah, this week. Um, we will try to do something more sensible, like uh, not to stop the server, right? The server shouldn't stop. But at least to log it uh, somewhere, to have a console log, et cetera, just to inspect what is happening, okay? But for the moment, just throw it. We are just playing a little bit with the library, so it's fine. And then for let of uh, let row of rows, so that's an array. We are just iterating over the array. Console log row. So actually, let's print the object. We don't really know what's what's inside the object. We hope the console log is smart enough to 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 print what's inside this object in, in a sensible way, and then and then we will. Um, see if, if things work. Okay, so that's a potential result of what's happening here. So uh, supposing there are no errors, of course. So the database contains a few records and um, uh, you print each element of the array. Each element is an object and the object has a number of fields and these fields are the names of the columns that you specified in the database. So we can go back and see, you see code, name, etc. okay? We did a left join. So basically the resulting table has more columns and we get them here, okay? Uh, we are assuming that uh, you are uh, a bit familiar with SQL, 
shouldn't be a problem, but I, I mean, really the, the most difficult thing that, you, that we expect that we, you need to do in SQL is really doing a join, okay? So like here, I mean, this is just left join because so you discarded the rows where there are no scores and this stuff, but I mean, you can do it later if you are not so familiar with the, with the um, SQL, okay? I mean, really the maximum thing you need to know uh, is the join. Actually, you could also, you know, not using, you, you don't really need to use the join, but you need to write my, more code if you actually don't, don't use the join, because you need to join things uh, by yourself by iterating over the arrays and so on. So if you know a bit of SQL, that's better, right? But, you know, for inserting, updating, deleting, typically are just single instruction operating on single rex. Maybe you need to delete two things, you, you will run two queries and that's all, okay? Fine. And uh, um, so that's a potential result of well, what you are going to do here. Um, and, yeah. Let's just have a look uh, at this, okay? And then, yeah. And then we will see the example and then stop for the break. Let's say we are, let's say, smart <laughs> in a certain sense. We would like to do things uh, in a bit different way, right? I mean, it's really inconvenient, right, to have uh, the console log here inside. Uh, because then, uh, it, it, okay, it's uh, just a console log, that's fine. I, I need to operate on this stuff, uh, on, on the results of the, uh, coming from the database and do, I don't know, some operations, uh, some checking and so on. Uh, I mean, writing code in the callbacks is not so convenient because it gets complicated, right? Because it's code which is inserted, uh, uh, it's nested in, an, in the code uh, of the, calling function and so on, right? So, uh, so there's a function that, that calls something, will call something and we need to write the stuff here, right? So let's say, let's take the array outside, right? Define an array outside, the result, empty array. Instead of operating on the array here, okay, we just, Add the rows, okay, to the result here. Okay, so what's the problem? Is there any problem? Le let's try to think what's in wh what's happening here. Okay. Um, so we define an empty array. We run the query. The query will run. The callback is called. That's fine. We print the result. We've seen that uh, the result actually was printed. Like, actually, I didn't run this example, but uh, I mean, we, I showed you uh, it should work, right? So, if you push the row here inside the result, you should take the object and put it into the result array, right? No problem. What's, what is the problem? Actually, the problem is here. So, for let row of result, this is just a standard way of iterating over the array and print what's inside the array, right? No problem. Try to run this code. <laughs> you will get an empty array. Why you get an empty array? Just because you will run this for, uh, here on, on the last, last lanes, lay, uh, lines of code, before the callback has been called, okay? It's an asynchronous callback. It's not a synchronous callback. It's not like, you know, the, what we pass to the filter map, etc. that get executed immediately because the map runs immediately and executes the, the callbacks immediately. This is asynchronous, so this will be called later when we get the results from the database, okay? So in short, you say, uh, DB, please run this query, and then call this callback when you finished, right? 
That's what you do with this DB all. And the DB all is over, it's finished. And then JavaScript goes to the next instruction. So you get a nice uh, line of uh, asterisks. And then you get four letter of results. And no problem, result is defined here. Just an empty array. So there's nothing to iterate. Console load doesn't get called, and that's all. Program is finished, right? Well, not yet finished, actually, because you register the callback. So it means there's still this callback that needs to be executed. So the node environment knows this, and so the program doesn't finish the execution. But it will later run the callback. The callback will be executed. So this console log will get printed with the actual values as before. The result will be filled. But the problem is that we already printed the results, right? So actually, if we don't print the result inside here, how can we print the result outside the callback? That's a big problem, right? It's not easy to solve. It will take uh, one hour and a half to solve it, right? Because, because we don't really know when the callback will be executed. It's asynchronous. That's a big problem that we need to solve, OK? So it's, there's nothing really wrong with this code. I mean, it, it, it runs. The only thing, it doesn't do what we expect, because actually, probably, we would like to print a, 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 an array which is not empty, right? OK? And in the, in the end, it's not empty. The problem is that we don't know when it will be not empty, so full of the stuff that we need to uh, process, OK? So queries are actually executed asynchronously, and that's a big problem, right? So especially if you have many queries and so on, you should write everything inside uh, the callback just to make sure that you know, uh, uh, everything gets executed at the right time. So after that, the query has been run. But let's, let's think an, an, of an example where, let's say, you insert and then select, and insert and select, and so on. So you do many operations on the DB, especially if there's a loop, OK? I mean, a code like this will not work. So if you just uh, say, I would like to do 100 inserts in the DB, OK? Uh, you cannot just say DB run, OK, if there's an error, throw an error, and then DB all, et cetera. Because the DB all, or uh, running this query, will not wait for the other to be executed, unless you put it into inside the callback, right? But if you have a loop, how can you do? <coughs> I mean, you, you need to write things 100 times, but if you need 200 times, you know, it's not really a way of, of proceedings. And we can actually experiment uh, with this behavior. Uh, it's difficult to, to solve it, OK? Just let me see if I can run this uh, on the, f no, maybe it's better I do it after the, after the break, OK? I need to copy a few files and make those files available to you as well, OK? So we'll see this behavior after the break, OK? Really in practice, running it in, in Visual Studio Code. So, so you, can, you can try it yourself. And so this will take us to uh, the, the last topic of today. This takes the whole uh, one hour and a half. So how to solve these kind of problems? So how to wait and write better code Instead of you know filling up uh, uh, the, the callbacks with the uh, code that ge will get uh, more and more difficult to be uh, you know written and also uh, uh, read after that you wrote it okay so to the bug and so on okay I think we can break if you have no questions so in the meanwhile I prepare the examples uh, and make this these files available so. I don't know, 10 minutes break, more or less, eh? and we'll start again after the break. Thanks.